Hello, I'm John Rossi, a touring drummer with a love of all things animal. When I'm on the road, I visit as many zoos, aquariums... Hey, wait a minute. What's going on? Hey, what's going on there? Hello? Hello? We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you Rossafari Zoo News. News you can use from the world of zoos and conservation. Every week, we bring you breaking news and analysis from around the globe, featuring the animals you love and the people who care for them. And here's your anchorman, John Rossi. Hello, 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 and welcome to Rossafari Zoo News, the show that's completely made up and the points don't matter. No, wait. That was whose line is it anyway? Anyone? Anyone get that joke? Reference? No? Yes? I don't know. You're listening asynchronously, and I'm recording this before it is out, so uh, I guess you can't answer me. Um, but hey, look, I improvised a joke about a, an improvisational comedy show to start this episode. We're doing great, y'all. We're doing great. This is going to be a wonderful episode because, hey, let's be honest. It can only go uphill from here. Uh, but yeah, this is Rossafari Zoo News. Not everything is made up. In fact, it is all actual news stories about the uh, world of zoos and aquariums and animals and conservation and all that good stuff. And uh, this is a crowd-sourced news show. So if you happen to see some zoo news worthy stories out there in the world, you can email them to me, rasafaripod at gmail.com, or feel free to tag me in them on the social media places like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I'm at rasafari on all of those, or at rasafaripod on the TikTok. Hey, you know, speaking of the various social medias, um, I, I wanted to take a moment to, uh, to point out to my fans who are on Facebook that um, the way Facebook has been working lately, I think y'all are just missing some stuff. Uh, so really, it's just been recently. I've, I've never worked to build up uh, Facebook that much. And um, Insta was always kind of the home. And then TikTok took off when I was drumming with Emily. And um, uh, Facebook just kind of exists. And it's it's there. And honestly, I, I barely go on other than to answer some comments Uh Everything that I post on Instagram is just supposed to automatically populate to Facebook. However, I've been hearing that um, my reels that I post are not posting to Facebook. So if you happen to be a Facebook fan and Facebook is your main way of, of seeing what's going on, uh, you're going to miss some stuff because honestly, I post reels directly to Instagram and um, I don't like build them on my phone or anything. So I can't just go and manually repost them on my page. Uh, but I recently posted a video of me playing catch with a sea lion on there. And I did another video of uh, my bandmates in Great Balls of Fire getting to meet sea lions with me and um, probably some other recent stuff that that didn't involve sea lions. Oh, yeah, there's a um, I met a really cool porcupine species. It was a black tailed hairy dwarf porcupine. There are only a few in captivity in the country. And um, I posted a video of, of one eating some food. Uh, on on Instagram as well. I also do Rossafari live on there occasionally when I'm at a zoo where I will start the camera rolling live and show you what I'm looking at. Uh, most recently, I did a, an exhibit uh, at the Central Park Zoo, uh, looking at their red panda exhibit and seeing some red panda zoomies and also um, at the Akron Zoo with Mila, the um, now virtually famous uh, snow leopard that's two years old that lives there. So my point in saying all of this is that if you are one of my Facebook peeps, um, I apologize, but not everything seems to be as visible for y'all as it is for everyone else. So maybe check it out on Instagram or maybe if you go and search reels on Facebook, you can find it. But um, yeah, just want to let y'all know that there is that content out there. As as my Facebook community keeps growing and thriving, I'm like, ah, y'all are getting left, left behind a little bit on some of the, the stuff. So I thought I would mention it on here. All right. Well, that's enough rambling and prattling on in this introduction. So uh, I guess it's time to get to it. Wow. Two, three, four. Ow, there's a funky monkey, tree kangaroo, or a binturong. It's two news, yeah.
All right. So whenever one of these lists comes out, I feel the need to share it with you all, um, but with some caveats. I am talking, of course, about, you know, these these lists that come up on websites and are they really good or do they exist to get clicks or whatever. Um, but a website called allpets.com recently announced the top 35 aquariums in the United States. Uh, their judging criteria was based on a bunch of things, including Yelp reviews and other random opinions. And um, as wary of these types of things as I am, I thought it was worth mentioning the top 10, uh, you know, just to give those facilities some props. So coming in at number 10 was the Henry Dorley Zoo and Aquarium. Number nine was the Newport Aquarium in Newport, Kentucky, which, by the way, is um, right across the river from uh, Cincinnati. It's it's kind of like how Adventure Aquarium is Philadelphia's aquarium, even though it's in Camden, New Jersey. Uh, this is the Cincinnati Aquarium, even though it is the Newport Aquarium because it's technically across the river. Number eight is the South Carolina Aquarium in Charleston, South Carolina, and I freaking love that aquarium. Number seven is the Tennessee Aquarium in Chattanooga, Tennessee, another one that I love. Uh, number six is the Oregon Coast Aquarium. Number five is the Texas State Aquarium in Corpus Christi. I've been there a couple times. It's a cool little little place. Number four is Sea Life Minnesota uh, in uh, Bloomington, Minnesota. Number three is the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Number two is the Alaska Sea Life Center. And number one is the New England Aquarium in Boston, Massachusetts. And that right there is, is why I love and hate these lists all at once. Um, the New England Aquarium is incredible, and congratulations to them. And yo, use this to market yourselves and get more people in. And uh, if you've all been listening to the pod for a while, you know that I am in love with Myrtle, the uh, the queen of the aquarium, uh, one of the sea turtles that lives there. She's just amazing and beautiful and awesome, and I just I adore her. Uh, it's a great aquarium. It really is. But you may notice that a couple of other really great aquariums were missing from the top 10 list. So uh, to give you a, a little idea, uh, number 23 is Aquarium of the Pacific, which is a, both an amazing aquarium and just, just a great friend of the pod and, and just no, it shouldn't be that low. Number four is Shed Aquarium in Chicago, which is, again, just just awesome, just so good. But number 25 According to allpets.com, the 25th best aquarium in the U.S. is the Georgia Aquarium in Atlanta, Georgia. Come on, y'all. That's ridiculous. It is an amazing aquarium. It is the only place where you can see manta rays and whale sharks. They have it's 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 the gold standard. It just it is. I apologize to everywhere else that that rated a higher than them on here, but but it's it's just it no, no, wrong. And um so yeah, I don't know. It just uh, like I said, congratulations to the winners and and you all they're all great aquariums like yay go team but also um you know this is why i take these lists with a grain of salt because the georgia aquarium should not be down that low so uh yeah something to think about whenever you see these kind of lists and you know part of it if i can get uh get rambling even longer on this topic um is that uh you know if you're using yelp reviews to figure things out the more famous bigger places are also the ones that attract the most anti-captivity people so they're the ones that are going to get review bombed and have those kinds of issues and, and stuff like that so just something to think about but uh yeah there you have it kind of your top 10 aquariums for the year 2023 from one site, kind of. All right, so clearly the top Zoo News story for this week, the one that got the most attention by far, is that there was an incident at the Dallas Zoo earlier this week, and it was really interesting to follow along. So the Dallas Zoo announced that they were unexpectedly closed one day, 
and then posted a follow-up comment saying that they have an ongoing situation at the zoo with a code blue that is a non-dangerous animal that is out of its habitat. One of our clouded leopards was not in its habitat when the team arrived this morning and is unaccounted for at this time. Dallas Police Department is on site assisting with the search efforts. The zoo is closed today as our team works to find and recover the animal. So that's how it all started. And we found out that there was, you know, a clouded leopard that that had um, gotten out of its habitat. And that's that's scary enough. And, and people were all checking it out. And, you know, one of the things that annoys me so much is that a bunch of um, local and the national media started reporting on it, saying that a leopard was out and loose in the zoo. And uh, there's a big difference between cloudies and, and you know, leopard leopards. So um, that was annoying. But anyway... And they were able to find the clouded leopard, who, who was named Nova, um, at about 4.40 p.m. Uh, she had been hiding very near her original habitat. And uh, she was secured and checked out by vets and all of that stuff. And once she was deemed to be healthy, she was moved back on exhibit. Yay! However, that's not actually the end of the story. Because um, the next day, uh, the Dallas Zoo did work to have conservation interpreters from their staff on site and at the habitat all day. Uh, and then they did it actually again on Sunday as well to be able to answer guests questions about Nova and the incident and all that stuff. So all of that is really exciting. But then there was also the sad bit that the Dallas Police Department ended up opening a criminal investigation into the incident because it turns out that somebody came along and cut the habitat. They opened up a hole in the fencing of the habitat, and that is why Nova was able to escape. Upon further investigation, the Dallas police also found that one of the monkey exhibits had the same type of hole cut in the fencing, although none of the primates escaped. As of this time, they don't know what, what happened here. There are a couple of uh, different possibilities. Um, but, you know, I don't know. Was this just a childish prank that somebody thought was funny? Was this anti-captivity people trying to wreak havoc and show that zoos are evil? Although, actually, all the Dallas Zoo ended up doing was showing that they're really good at handling emergency situations. Yeah, really, I, I just don't know. There's no way to know at this time. But whatever it was, uh, all of the animals and all of the humans were safe and, and everything is okay. And um, hopefully uh, other zoos, you know, stay vigilant in case this was the start of something. But hopefully it was just a fluke and we can get to the bottom of it. Recently, the Oregon Zoo shared a project that they're involved with that I thought was really cool. So there are um, frogs up there that are known as red-legged frogs because they have red legs. Uh, and unfortunately, um, when they go on the move to mate, they have to cross multiple highways and um, all kinds of other dangerous places in order to actually get to their mating grounds and, and successfully mate with the females of the species. The males are the ones that have to do all the moving. And um, so there, this is a huge problem, and a lot of frogs were dying. And there's talk about installing, like, underpasses, uh, wildlife corridors so that the frogs can get under the, the highways and such. But as of right now, that's not happening. So the Oregon Zoo, along with some other organizations, uh, have volunteers that go out at night and find these frogs as they are hopping towards the highway and gather them up and take them on their little frog taxi ride to their spawning grounds. And then pick them up again as they're heading back away from those grounds to um, to get them safely across the highways again. It's just a really cool example of, you know, zoos and other organizations uh, figuring out ways to solve problems and, and help out species in a way that doesn't get a lot of credit often. But I'm glad Oregon was sharing about it, and uh, it's very cool to see this story. I would love to be a frog taxi driver at some point. The Houston Zoo has announced a major new exhibit that sounds really, really cool. 
Uh, the exhibit is called Galapagos Islands, and it will open on Friday, April 7th of this year. Um, it is the first major exhibit of its kind in the world, and it exists to showcase the remarkable wildlife of the Galapagos Island chain and to immerse guests in an environment evoking the archipelago's unique landscapes and oceanic habitats. Uh, there will be Galapagos tortoises. There will be a colony of Humboldt penguins, California sea lions, which... I think are from California, not the Galapagos, but hey, I'm just reading their release. Um, and uh, and the, the picture has a sea turtle. I'm assuming there will be a sea turtle because they have a picture of a sea turtle. So I'm assuming that. And if I'm wrong, I'm very mad at the Houston Zoo. Uh, but it looks like it's going to be a really amazing exhibit. And uh, I hope I can get down to Houston sometime this year and, and check it out. The Denver Zoo recently posted a really adorable series of pictures of their western lowland gorilla named Cal and his trusty milk crate. So when it snows in Denver, but then the temperature gets warm enough, even if there's still snow on the ground, the gorilla troop has the opportunity to go outside and be in the snow. And on one particular day, um, the keepers uh, created some gorilla-friendly slushy using sugar-free Kool-Aid and the snow for them to explore. Well, Cal was really into the slushy, but he doesn't like his little tootsies to get cold, which is really funny to say about, like, a large silverback gorilla. Um, and so perfectly exhibiting how gorillas, you know, use tools. He picked up a milk crate took it outside, and perched on the milk crate while enjoying the slushy, thus staying out of the snow. Y'all, go to at Denver Zoo and check this out. It is adorable, but it's also like such a great moment of education to really show what uh, great apes using tools looks like. And frankly, what it looks like is adorable. So two weeks ago, I told y'all that the Oakland Zoo had a major sinkhole uh, in front of it, fortunately not on zoo grounds, but blocking the entrance uh, for people to get to it, and so that the zoo was going to be closed until January 17th. Unfortunately, that date has been extended to sometime in early February um, because the sinkhole was just huge and ridiculous and construction crews are still working on it. So the zoo will remain closed until early February, at which point it will hopefully reopen. Uh, and, you know, as I mentioned the last time, staff is able to get there through back entrances and stuff. All of the animals are fine. All of the people are fine. But uh, the city of Oakland needs to, to get this figured out and get this taken care of. All right. And now it is time to get some goodbyes out of the way. Uh, so we're going to start off with a red panda named Dusk who lived at the Calgary Zoo in Canada. Uh, Dusk was eight 18.5 years old, one of the oldest red pandas in all of North America. And unfortunately, um, the heart disease and kidney disease uh, that had existed in, in dusk for a while continued to get worse and his quality of life started to decline. So uh, the decision was made to humanely euthanize him. Um, very, very sad, but also just an incredible story. 18.5 years old. That's, that's astonishing. The median life expectancy for red pandas under human care is 10 years and, um, you know, less than that in the wild. So, uh, that's just really, really amazing to hear. So great job, but also condolences to everyone at the Calgary Zoo. And speaking of geriatric uh, animals, Woodland Park Zoo announced that Didin, a 17-year-old snow leopard, has passed away. Uh, Didin suffered um, from kidney failure as well as respiratory issues and so also needed to be euthanized. Uh, Didin was a calm and sweet but also sometimes aloof uh, cat. And um, he had a mate and a son, Abek, who still lives at uh, Woodland Park Zoo. So um, just a sad loss for the keepers. But again, an older animal who lived a great life and, and only saw as many years as he did because of the incredible care given to him at Woodland Park Zoo. And for our next story, I'm actually going to turn it over to a special guest. 
I was recently at the Akron Zoo recording a new episode and um, found out that they lost a beloved animal there. So uh, here's Elena Bell to tell you more about that. Elena, uh, I was just talking here on Zoo News about um, the fact that, yeah, you suffered a bit of a loss here at the zoo. So go ahead and tell me about that. Yeah, we just lost Draco, our female Komodo dragon. She was 12 years old. She's lived here at the Akron Zoo for over 10 years, and she was loved by all. She was a great Komodo dragon. And I would say my favorite video of her that we've ever shared is a video of her swallowing a whole chicken. And it's a four minute long video. And I have found so many different ways to use that video because I think it's fantastic. (laughs) I loved it so much. And it was just so funny. And she was so cooperative. Like she just let the keepers like, oh, you wanted to video me swallowing this chicken. Cool. That's fine. As long as I get the chicken. And she was just very trusting. She had built such a relationship with all of her care team that she that we were able to make great strides in the care of Komodo dragons. So she was voluntarily ultrasound trained. Wow. So she would do voluntary ultrasounds and stuff. And so because of her, we were able to share this information with other AZA organizations for the care of Komodo dragons. So um, to lose her was, it was a hit and we felt it. We feel it with every animal, but especially with her. So we will miss her. Well, yeah, thank you for sharing that. So yeah, a sad story out of Akron, but um, awesome to hear that legacy shared by by somebody who, you know, Really love Draco. Thanks for doing that, Elena. And uh, I'm sure everyone looks forward to the episode coming soon. And last but not least in the sad department, uh, Zoo Atlanta is um, sad to announce the death of Tahoe, the Harris Hawk, who uh, was part of the bird show at the World of Wild Theater for over 20 years. Um, Tahoe died mysteriously and uh, the team is still actively investigating the cause of his death um but tahoe was housed in a secure outdoor mew an outdoor enclosure but perfectly secure still appeared to be secure after the fact died from injuries sustained from an altercation with a wild animal Um, The team has checked that Mew and all of the other Mews and also put up some additional security uh, precautions to try to figure out what happened and and prevent it until and after they do figure out what actually happened. But, you know, Zoo Atlanta is in a park and um, wild animals exist there. And actually uh, seeing wild animals at zoos is always kind of cool. I like to call them bonus animals. But um, apparently in this case, it led to a bit of conflict. So I'll be curious to see uh, if Zoo Atlanta announces what the cause of Tahoe's death was and, and is able to figure it out. And hopefully it can be something that can be solved at Zoo Atlanta and then help the large zoo community at large avoid other issues like this. So here's a crazy story. A family in Bloomington, Illinois, heard some uh, noises in their garage on Wednesday and just kind of left it alone. And the next day they went out to investigate and see, you know, if there was like a raccoon or something that had gotten in. Nope. It was a ring-tailed lemur. Now, in case you haven't gone and listened to my episode with uh, our lemur scientist friends from from earlier this week, uh, it turns out that lemurs are not actually from Illinois, but are actually from Madagascar. So that was confusing. And uh, the Illinois Conservation Police teamed up with Miller Park Zoo to safely get the ring-tailed lemur out of the garage and to the zoo where the vet team has given uh, it a clean bill of health and also have temporarily named it Julian after one of the lemurs from the movie Madagascar. Again, the movie is called Madagascar, not Illinois. And um, yeah, so it's just just really cool that Miller Park Zoo was able to step in and help. Um and uh, ring-tailed lemurs are an endangered species, so this is a big deal, and hopefully whatever happened is figured out. But uh, I got to tell you, while, while I am well aware of the fact that lemurs do not make good pets and I would never let one into my house and all of that is very bad, you know, if one had to escape from somewhere, I'm just saying that my garage is a good garage to show up in because I would love that while also making sure that I got in touch with the proper authorities and it was properly taken care of. Probably. 
I kid, I kid. Of course, we do not have lemurs as pets, so yeah. But also, I wanted to share with you all that I have um, always been aware of a town called Bloomington, Indiana, and so um, I had to constantly force myself to say Illinois in that story. Um, Originally, the whole thing just said Indiana, so that's how my night's going. A female zebra shark at Shedd Aquarium in Chicago has given birth by parthenogenesis. In other words, she fertilized her own eggs, something that it is known that zebra sharks can do, um, and then had babies directly from that, which is similar to cloning, but it isn't the exact same genetic code as the parent, which would happen with a clone. So it's not quite clones that she had but it was it was close to it but what makes this so newsworthy uh, despite the fact that you know parthenogenesis is really weird and cool and rare to begin with is the fact that in this case the female shark shared a tank with two males this is only the second time that it has ever been recorded that a female zebra shark decided to um, give birth through this process rather than mating when males were available See, basically, our understanding of parthenogenesis is that it is only a um, backup system in general uh, for when mates are hard to come by uh, because animals born this way uh, generally have shorter lifespans and are frequently sterile. Uh, in the case of this shark, the the two pups or sharklets that she had died after just a few months, um, and that's just not uncommon in this situation. So it's really interesting um, that this happened when there were males there. And hopefully as they continue to study this, they will be able to uh, get a better understanding of what causes different species and, and different individuals to decide to use parthenogenesis, especially when mates are around. Tanganyika Wildlife Park in Wichita, Kansas, has also announced a pretty exciting pregnancy. Their female Indian rhino named Monica is expecting her first baby with her partner, Stax. The reason this is so exciting is that Monica was Tanganyika's first Indian rhino born through artificial insemination. And this will be the first baby born from an Indian rhino who had been born via um, artificial insemination. So this is really a big deal because one way that you, you know, can tell whether something is working all the way and working properly like AI is whether those animals are able to reproduce. And now it seems like the answer is yes. So congrats to everyone at Tanganyika. And this is really exciting uh, news for um, rhino artificial insemination in general. Imagine the surprise of the police of the Albuquerque Police Department when they responded to a shooting on Tuesday and found a trail of blood that led them to a trailer that had a dog crate in it. Except it wasn't actually a dog crate, because what was inside was a tiger cub. Not wounded. The blood was not the tiger cubs. Uh, It was human blood, so, you know, who cares? Uh, So the police were able to take the 20-pound tiger cub to the ABQ Biopark Zoo, our friends over there taking good care of the tiger, which seems very healthy. And uh, so they're trying to figure out exactly... um, what is going to happen with the tiger. And they're also doing an investigation to try to figure out exactly how the tiger got there. Everything's ongoing, but what matters is that the little tiger cub or tiglet is doing great at ABQ Biopark. I love these types of stories so much. Our friends at the Elmwood Park Zoo recently teamed up with the Norristown Police Department and made a donation to them to help cover the cost of canine training, equipment, and tools to help canine Neuro and canine Captain and their handlers succeed in their careers. So Nero and Captain are two new police dogs with the Norristown Police Department and Elmwood Park Zoo, understanding the value of working dogs, 
decided to chip in and help with uh, with those costs. And I just think that's a really cool thing um, that they did. Elmwood Park Zoo is a dog friendly zoo, not all the time, but they do have dog days there. As a matter of fact, I know somebody who got married at that zoo and happened to have their three dogs present. I guess I know two people. I was one of them, but I know the other one too because I married her. Anyway, the point is, so yeah, it's a dog-friendly zoo that is also, um, you know, a community-friendly zoo, and I love seeing them help out in this way. This week, the Toronto Zoo announced that a number of baby Madagascar rainbow fish were born at the facility just before the end of 2022. Uh, these fish are super hard to take care of and super rare to find in captivity. In fact, at this moment, the Toronto Zoo is the only zoo actually doing research on them with an eye towards reintroduction into Madagascar. Yeah, how cool is that? So uh, the hope here is that the Toronto Zoo will be able to release these fish into the wild. And, um, you know, it's just worth mentioning the steps that they go to to take care of these little baby fish or fishlets, uh, are, are just quite extraordinary. Um, larval crustaceans, uh, brine shrimp and water fleas, are fed to them because their mouths are incredibly small because they're so, you know, tiny fish, tiny mouths. They actually have to use spirulina powder, like you would find at a health store, to uh, feed the prey items because they are even smaller. They also put snails into the tank because the um, water fleas that these fish eat will feast on snail feces. So they have to create this insane tank ecosystem um, with multiple, you know, different types of species uh, in what's called a co-culture so that all of the tiny fish have access to tiny prey, but the tiny prey can eat and all of that. This is an undertaking, y'all, but I'll tell you what. If they're able to re-release these fish into Madagascar, that will be a huge conservation win. And maybe as a step towards that, they can try reintroducing them into a garage in Bloomington, Illinois, not Bloomington, Indiana, because uh, there are already some endemic Madagascar species that live there, at least short term. And then last but not least uh, for Zoo News this week, our good friends at Adventure Aquarium recently announced that a new giant Pacific octopus has joined the collection there, and it is a mysterious octopus. The octopus is named Charlie, and it is missing part of its third arm. Now, that is how people determine the sex of an octopus. It's literally based on how far the suction cups go down the third arm of the octopus. So without being able to see that, the uh, aquarium staff does not know whether Charlie is a male or a female. Um, so at this point, the only way to tell would be that if Charlie lays eggs, then Charlie is a female. And um, the only other way to tell will be um, at a necropsy uh, post-mortem. So hopefully, uh, unless eggs happen, we won't find out for a very long time what exactly sex Charlie is. And on a quick side note, uh, y'all know I have a great relationship with Adventure Aquarium. They've been on the pod a couple times already, and I have made it my mission to become best friends with Charlie. So wish me luck on that one, y'all. Conservation, conservation, news time. Oh, yeah. The Cheetah Conservation Fund announced that one of their female dogs, um, Katira, went into labor and gave birth to five male and three female puppies, all of which survived and are thriving and um, are going to be learning how to be working dogs uh, for CCF. Uh, now, these um, eight puppies join the 18 other dogs that already live on site, which sounds like a lot, but here's the thing. We've talked about this before, but CCF uses Anatolian shepherds for a lot of purposes there. Um, however, uh, Katira is actually a mixed breed local dog, not an Anatolian, and she is part of a new program where they are working with farmers to see if they can get mixed breed dogs working as well as Anatolians. 
Uh, they are smaller than the shepherds and thus are cheaper to feed and also might be more advantageous to have in more communal areas because of the size. So this is like a really cool thing that they're trying to experiment with. And um, so having these puppies or doglets uh, is going to help with that program and, and help see how this experiment goes. So this is pretty exciting news for the CCF. A multi-year investigation has led to eight people being um, arrested and sent to jail for running a snake trafficking ring in Florida. Nearly 200 snakes consisting of 24 species from seven different regions of the globe were purchased by undercover agents uh, from this ring as they took it down. And this is extra problematic in Florida because they already have a problem with, um, you know, invasive species and especially invasive snake species being released into the wild and causing problems. For instance, a 15 foot long Burmese python held up traffic in both directions as it very slowly crossed a highway in Florida recently. There are just all these problems with the ecosystem being taken out of balance because of invasive snakes. And um, so, yeah, getting this ring busted was a good thing. And it's, it's just a problem that continues in Florida. In South Australia, there is now a call to possibly cancel duck hunting season this year. Duck hunting season runs from March through May, so three months. And um, unfortunately, there are a bunch of floods happening uh, in the River Murray area. And um, these floods are wiping out duck populations and destroying nests and um, drowning eggs and just all kinds of bad things. So the duck population is on the decline, and yet hunters are still calling for the ability to hunt this species. So right now there is this big conflict going on in Australia um, and specifically in the state of South Australia. And it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with this uh, because – Duck hunting is a real popular activity, and a lot of the people there do actually hunt for food, but also the species population is declining this year, so I'll be curious to see what they end up doing with that. And speaking of hunting populations that are in trouble... A new wolf hunt is being allowed in Oregon. This is because one specific pack, um, which includes two uh, adult wolves, has been killing some livestock animals, including five calves. As such, uh, because the pack was identified, the individuals were identified, and because um, the attacks have been ruled a rapid behavioral pattern, um, either the USDA Wildlife Services or local cattle farmers are allowed to shoot these wolves. Now, this is an endangered species, but because we think our species is more important and because they're going after livestock, which, you know, these farmers need to make a living, two of these wolves get to be shot. Now, I want to be clear here. This is not open hunting season. If somebody goes out and shoots the wrong wolf, they have killed an endangered animal and have to deal with the consequences. Uh, but yeah, there are, there are two, two gray wolves that are now slated for execution because they are living their natural lives. And despite the fact that they are endangered because humans matter more, they can now be shot. And speaking of endangered animals being shot, sorry, y'all, but a polar bear in Alaska has been shot to death after it mauled and killed a woman and a boy after chasing multiple residents in a small village. Uh, they're not entirely sure what was going on with this polar bear, but um, it just decided to attack a village, and as such... Um, you know, was shot dead. So another polar bear is lost, but this one makes a little more sense to me than the wolf hunt. It's still a hell of a tragedy, though. 
To end the conservation news on a happier note, um, new footage out of the uh, waters of Brazil and Bolivia show the largest ever gathering of turtles on the planet. Um, there's new drone footage that was gotten by WCS, so our friends up the the Bronx Zoo and all that stuff uh, from their research facility is down in that area. Um, that shows baby giant South American river turtles hatching, also known as turtlets. And it is absolutely astonishing. There are hundreds of thousands of baby turtles. If you have the opportunity, Google this because it is astonishing to see and is really adorable and will make you feel really happy. At least it made me feel really happy. So, hey, y'all remember my episode with Shane Gorbett a couple months ago where we talked about the Animal Behavior Management Alliance, also known as the ABMA? Well, for the next two weeks or so until the end of this month, you can get $15 off any membership to the ABMA. Now, this is a group that Shane is not only involved with, but so is Jake Belair, my very first guest, and a lot of awesome other people that you have heard on the podcast. So if you have any interest at all, in uh, animal training stuff, animal behavior stuff, all those good things, go ahead and check them out on Facebook or on um, Instagram. Uh, I'll include links in the show notes and become a member of ABMA. They're awesome. And a ringtail, uh, commonly called a ringtail cat, although they're not cats, but the little cute, almost squirrel or cat-like animals that have long ringed tails and are thus called ringtails, uh, lived in a Kohl's store for three weeks in Colorado, hanging out in the shoe department, eating ceiling tiles and shoe boxes, uh, and slipping through the cat traps that they set up without tripping them. Uh, but eventually they were able to catch the ringtail and release it back into the wild. I just think it's so great that, uh, A, the ringtail got away scot-free, and B, that it was just living in a shoe department in a Coles. What an awesome animal. Oh, animal, oh, animal, animal holidays, animal, oh, animal, animal holidays, hey! All right, so if you are listening to this on the release day, uh, Friday the 20th, then uh, happy Penguin Awareness Day! Make sure you are wildly aware of all of the amazing penguins out there, and go check in uh, with our friends at Penguins International to see how they are helping you become aware of the various penguin species out there. Then the 21st is Squirrel Appreciation Day, so make sure you're appreciating all of the squirrels that you see. Sunday the 22nd is uh, the Chinese New Year, and we are entering the Year of the Rabbit. And then on Tuesday the 24th, it is the International Day of Education, which really doesn't have much to do with animals or zoos in particular, but zoos are, you know, a good place for education. And obviously this podcast hopes to educate you about what they're doing and what's going on with conservation and stuff. So um, we'll take it. Anyway, those are your animal holidays for the week. There you have it, folks. Another week of Rasafari Zoo News is coming to an end. I would like to say thank you to my Red Panda level patrons, Lara Shank and Kristen Dickey, and also to all of my patrons and remind you all that you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month by heading to patreon.com slash rossafari and signing up for a monthly membership. You get cool little things like bonus audio from some of the episodes and discussions, and I uh, get to kind of help shape the podcast a little bit, and um, you also get my undying love, which, I mean, undying love for $3 a month is pretty cheap when you think about it. So, you know, go check it out. Uh, you can also Venmo me a one-time donation if you'd like to give a little support uh, at rossafari on Venmo. 
I would like to say thank you to everyone who contributed this week, y'all. This is the longest the list has ever been, and I'm so excited about it. So yes, let me thank the following people for contributing their stories. And also, y'all, I had so many stories that some of you may have contributed something that didn't get on this week that you're going to hear next week because we could have kept going for a long time on this one. But anyway, thank you to deep breath this time. <gasps> Anya Keen, Colleen Lenahan, Kim Cooley, Carrie Kirkpatrick, Kevin Williams, Kristen Khalil, Margaret Johnson, Jacob Newman, Zoe Rossi, Zen from Zen Critters, Megan Barrett, Emily Rockbuck, Marianne Rossi, Liz Dunlevy, Michael, Sebastian, and Paul Somo. Thank you all so very much. And remember, friends, the words Newsy Credits Backwards are Steiderk Yeswen. The Rossafari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Rossafari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Rossafari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.